Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. It's 2022, and so I thought it'd be nice to start off the new year with a rebuttal. So this is a video that I have been looking forward to rebutting for a long time. I really wanted to respond to it, and I just hadn't found the right opportunity to do so. But I think we do have a good opportunity because I have a great guest who's going to join us on the show today to help us do that. His name is Michael Lofton. He's the host of the Reason and Theology show. Uh, and he has a background in the subject that we're going to be discussing today, which is Eastern Orthodoxy or the Orthodox Church. So the video we're going to talk about is from Father Hosea Trenum, and it's a video on an Orthodox perspective on Roman Catholicism. And so we're going to respond to some of the arguments and critiques that he gives against the Catholic faith. Uh, but Michael, why don't you say hi and let us know you have some background with Father Hosea and with Eastern Orthodoxy. Yeah, and, and by the way, thanks for having me back on the show. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I actually had Father Josiah um, on the show, I want to say two years ago. Really pleasant discussion. I really enjoyed having a conversation with him. I greatly admire him. I, I respect him. I definitely disagree with his perspective about Catholicism, which is going to be brought out in a little bit, obviously. But um, be that as it may, I still respect him. So I've, I have had him on uh, the show. So a little bit of background there. And as you noted, I do have a little bit of background also in Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, I went to Eastern Orthodoxy for about three years before I returned to communion with Rome. All right. Uh, now, so what we're going to cover is not everything that is in his talk. It's about an hour long talk. I instead took yeah. out specific clips from the talk, but they amount to about half of it because I think that these are the, the, the strongest arguments or the most salient points that Father Josiah has when it comes to Catholicism. Some other things are, are interesting anecdotes or perspectives he has. Uh, a lot of the other things, though, are kind of complaints about Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And some of the complaints, I think Michael and I would say, yeah, you got a good point there. This particular liturgy or this particular priest or bishop isn't, uh, isn't really measuring up. But that's not really a, a solid argument against Catholicism. I think, Michael, you would agree with that. 100%. Um, there, there's a, a lot of those criticisms that he offered to that end. I would actually agree with him, but those aren't going to tell me, but where is the truth? Where is the fullness of the church that Christ established? Is, in fact, Rome what it claims to be? Is the papacy of a divine uh, origin? It, it's not going to answer those kinds of questions any more than if I were to look at um, profligate Israelites in the old covenant and say, well, look, you're, you're worshiping um, other gods here. You're clearly not God's covenant people. That doesn't follow. They they were God's covenant people, um, but right. they were not being faithful to the covenant. Um, and, and that may be the case today. Uh, there, there's quite a few of us, I'd imagine, who are not being faithful to the covenant. And I imagine there's times in our own lives where we're not being faithful. So, but that but that again doesn't tell me where is the truth. So those right. kinds of arguments I, I just have to set aside. Right, and that's what we're going to do. Instead, we're going to jump into more of the specific differences between Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. So let's jump into that. Okay, so I've marked each section with this uh, title card. So it'll give us kind of a heads up of the topic Father Josiah is going to talk about. So here we're going to talk about just the dating of the schism between uh, the Western Eastern Church and then the, the sacking of Constantinople during, I think it was the Fourth Crusade. Let's take a look at that. That is the separation of the Patriarch of Rome from the other Patriarchs of the East and the functional separation, at least for the late last 800 years, between Orthodoxy and Catholicism. We often, just for pedagogical purposes, like to use that date, 1054, uh, as the date for the Great Schism. Just so you know, nobody believed that at the time. In 1054, no one in the West or in the East thought that that marked the Great Schism and that that was somehow, you know, the road that we shouldn't have crossed and that was the end. If we really had to pin a date, I think a much better date to solidify the, the sense of the great schism is the sack of Constantinople in 1204 during the Fourth Crusade. It was at that time when the Latin Crusaders got misdirected and they came into Constantinople and killed our bishops and priests and raped our nuns on our altars. That is when we said, you know what? I don't think we're one. Okay, and then that's something that you hear all the time. It's like, you know, it's been 
It's made it been 800 years since the sack of Constantinople, but even this, it's not an accurate portrayal. The one thing that I would say Father Josiah is accurate about is that it's not like in the year 1054, every Catholic, everyone in the West and everyone in the East said, we're in separate churches now. Most people in their villages had no idea what was what would have been going on about the mutual excommunications between the Pope and the, the Eastern patriarchs. So I think he's right about that. But then he gets it wrong when he says, oh, it was definitely the real schism was this tragic event during the Fourth Crusade, where you have crusaders not attacking Muslims who have secured the Holy Land, but they're attacking fellow Christians in Constantinople. But even here, you would agree he's getting the history wrong. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, I, I'd hate to quibble with him over dates here, but I, I do want to note that in 1089, Bishop Callistus Ware is an Eastern Orthodox priest. He notes in 1089, the emperor asks the Patriarch of Constantinople, why is it that, you know, we aren't commemorating uh, the bishop in our liturgy, the Bishop of Rome, that is, in our right. liturgy? And they, the Synod noted that, well, there is somewhat of a de facto schism going on, not not de, de jure, not a legal schism, but right. kind of in practice. So even as early as 1089, they, they knew something was wrong, right. um, although there had been some problems prior to 1054 as well. And of course, afterwards, I'm not so sure that 1204, though, is really when uh, we could say the schism was really solidified. It definitely hurt relations between uh, Catholics and Orthodox. Right. And you can, in fact, see contemporary um, exchanges between the Latin patriarch and uh, some of the citizens um, of Constantinople on this question right after 1204, in the year 1206. And it's clear that they they don't think that they're in union with one another. At least the, the Greeks didn't think that they're in union with right. the Latins. Um so you do have definitely a partial schism going on in 1204. It, I'm of the opinion that really it's the repudiation of the Council of Florence that really solidified it. But mm-hmm. Callistus Ware, again, a bishop um, in Eastern Orthodoxy, is going right. to rightly note that even after Florence, as late as the 1700s, right. you have communion taking place between some Catholics and some Orthodox, especially in the Middle East, um, sharing in the sacraments of confession, um, preachers going and preaching in each other's uh, churches, m- ordinations from each other's bishops. Um, so you do have some sharing in sacred things, even right. until the 1700s. 50s. At that point, it becomes very clear that, okay, that's going to stop. And there really is a permanent schism or or an official schism at this point. Because it takes a while for this. It might, at the level of bishops or patriarchs, it has to filter down to other priests and lay people who might still be in communion with one another. So Mm -hmm. it it, it was a, a great, it was a gradual process leading up to 1054. And then the effects from there are gradually felt outwards. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, the well, and I agree with you that Florence, so for people who don't know, the Ecumenical Council of Florence was the attempted reunion council between East and West uh, that didn't succeed. But, you know, but that is, I think, where a lot of people might say, okay, we, we tried to bring this together, but there are still these theological divisions. Uh, let's talk just a little bit before we go to the next uh, part about the sack of Constantinople, because mm. uh, I thought the Pope had excommunicated mm. uh, some of those crusaders. It's not like the Pope just sent them into Constantinople. Yeah, that, that's correct. Pope Innocent III had already warned uh, these particular crusaders. It, first of all, if you attack the city of uh, Zara, you're automatically excommunicated. And the city of Zara was actually under a Christian crusader. So if you're going and attacking another Christian city, you're automatically excommunicated. And in fact, prior to 1204, they did just that. So these were people who were already excommunicated from the Catholic Church who go and sack Constantinople. Pope Innocent III was horrified by this. He he rejected it. There there is some criticism that can be offered here, though, of Pope Innocent III, even though um, he, he didn't agree with it. He still allowed there to be um, a patriarchate, 
you know, set up there in uh, Constantinople, replacing the Orthodox Patriarch, and that did cause some problems. Right. Um, so we, we might be able to criticize Pope Innocent there, but we can't criticize him insofar as him approving of this. He did not approve of it, and these were not Catholics in good standing. These were excommunicated people. And that's it's important to know. All right, let's, let's check the next section. So while maintaining the integrity of orthodoxy that we, after the schism, continue to believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and that that church is found in the Orthodox Church, not in the Roman Catholic Church, the, the typical Latin line for seven centuries that is found, for instance, in Thomas Aquinas's book that he wrote against the Greeks, which means against the Orthodox, just like we would say against the Latins, in which he said any Christian, any person not in communion with the Bishop of Rome is damned. That would be us. Uh, that position was radically altered by the, by the Latins. Uh, first, tenuously at the beginning of the 20th century. It came into full force in the middle of the 20th century. I have, a I have a book, which is a collection of papal documents of the 20th century about the Eastern Church. And one after another, they grow progressively more positive to us until they really reached a climax in Pope John Paul II's Orientale Lumen. And he made explicit affirmations about the legitimacy of orthodoxy, not that we cared that much, but it was a, a nice uh, recalibration of Catholic thinking about us, in which he affirmed the integrity of the Orthodox Church, suggesting that even though we didn't really know it, we were Catholic. <laughs> By the way, Vatican II also made that suggestion, which is rather insulting, about Protestants, that their baptism is really a Catholic baptism, they just don't know it. So all the Protestants are really Catholics. Very interesting theology. Uh, some, certainly not something they ever believed before that. Okay, so we have a, a lot to break down there, but mm. there's this, this idea, I think what he's trying to say is that, look, you had this very exclusivist tone in your theology. It's either the Catholic Church or bust uh, mm -hmm. since the, the schism. Uh, but now in the modern age, you're trying to play a lot nicer, even trying to say that we're all Catholic in some way. But I would reply say, well, no, that's not the case. Uh, the, the church has always recognized that even people who failed to recognize the authority of the Pope, for example, that there are still these imperfect bonds of communion that we can have with these other Christians, even while still recognizing uh, the differences there. So what would you say to this idea that he's saying that, oh, this is just kind of a modern novelty? It's definitely not a modern novelty. The issue of um, those who are not formally Catholic in relation to the Catholic Church, the, those people, um, that has been something that has developed in the last 2000 years. But substantially, there has been the claim that um, formal membership in the Catholic Church is not absolutely necessary for salvation. It's the ordinary means that God uses, but it's not absolutely necessary. And it's possible that someone could be united to the church without, you know, being a Ford formal member, a card-carrying Catholic, if you will. Um, so that, that's nothing new, um, especially in relation to the Eastern Orthodox, because we've noted for a very long time that they have valid sacraments. They are, um, they, they have valid bishops with apostolic succession. They have sacraments that offer grace so we, we've recognized this for a very long time. In fact, it, it wouldn't be possible for the popes um, in the last 500 years or so to be able to, on certain occasions, say that Catholics and Orthodox can actually share in Holy Communion with one another. Right. That wouldn't be possible if we believed that they were automatically damned and they don't have grace. And I also want to note something that he said there about Aquinas, if right. you don't mind. Sure. Dr. Marcus Plested, who is an Eastern Orthodox historian and theologian, really nice guy, had him on my show and really enjoyed his talk. He notes this about St. Thomas Aquinas, quote, he steadfastly refrains from designating the Greeks as heretics, preferring rather to speak of their heirs born of ignorance or stubbornness. And elsewhere, he says, quote, the Greeks were undoubtedly to be seen as church, possessed of grace and inheritors of a shared tradition. Uh, of course, he's speaking in the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. So he's rightly noting that right. Aquinas notes that 
there actually could be a mitigation of culpability here. If, in fact, maybe no culpability due to ignorance. And we have this concept called invincible ignorance. Mm -hmm. This is nothing new. This was a concept that Aquinas was familiar and speaks about in his uh, Summa Theologica. And again, he himself recognizes that the um, Eastern Orthodox are possessed of grace. Mm -hmm. Their sacraments have grace. So in other words, they, they can be saved. It's possible. As long as they are ignorant about the uh, claims about the Catholic Church, about the papacy, they're not putting an impediment between them and God and those sacraments and the grace that they're receiving in the sacraments. Right. So now, well, this is important because oh, Father mm -hmm. Josiah, you know, who says, oh, you know, he got Aquinas here against the Greeks. Well, mm -hmm. anyone you have a theological disagreement with, you're going to be, uh, you might write a treatise, you'll be against so-and-so. But clearly mm -hmm. Aquinas would not say that the Greeks, the Eastern Christians, would not say that against the Greeks or against the infidels, mm -hmm. that like these are the same kinds of people. They're mm -hmm. not because one has the grace of the sacraments and valid holy orders and one doesn't. There, we, we've always recognized it's worlds apart. That's Aquinas' position, right? He would, he would see them very differently than someone who is an infidel. Again, he does not think that the vast majority of Eastern Orthodox are culpably uh, ignorant or are um, deliberately putting barriers between themselves and God on the matter of the papacy, papacy or the filioque or something like that. He, he tends to think that um, th this is due to ignorance or stubbornness, as Dr. Pleston, uh, Pleston noted. Um, and and you might say, well, but the Greeks are familiar with the, the papal claims. They heard these claims, so therefore they're not ignorant. But we've long noted, our theologians and even popes have given approbation to this, we've long noted in the Catholic Church right. that just simply hearing the claim of the Catholic Church isn't necessarily what makes you culpable. It's that the gospel and the truth has been presented to you in a convincing way, but you are choosing to reject the truth. That's not the case for the vast majority of Eastern Orthodox in Aquinas' day and today as well. So really there isn't right. a, a change here substantially. There, there is a shifting in attitude. There's definitely that. There's a shifting in tone and a shifting in attitude, but I wouldn't say that there's a major substantial change here on part of Catholics in the way that we perceive Eastern Orthodox. Right, all right. Here, the next part is uh, the concern about the title, should we call the Pope the Patriarch of the West? Mm -hmm. Benedict XVI continued uh, John Paul II's view of the Orthodox East with some slight changes. One of the first things that Benedict XVI did when he became Pope was to slim down the titles for the Pope. And he removed immediately one title, and it made us sad because it was the one title we actually liked which is called the Patriarch of the West. He removed that. <laughs> didn't, didn't fit well with uh, papal infallibility. It sounds too collegial. One of the patriarchs. We weren't, I wasn't suggesting that he was a contemporary patriarch of the West. He's not, or was not. Um, but that was, uh, if, we, if, we, if we were gonna make a approach, a rapprochement with the, with the Catholic Church, that would be the title we would want the new Pope who wants to be Orthodox to emphasize and downplay the rest. All righty. So is the Pope the, the Patriarch of the West? My understanding was, I think it was in 2006 that, I mean, over time, different titles for the Pope uh, have appeared uh, and have been used in various ways uh, over the centuries. Uh, and this one was retired, I think, with a few others in 2006, primarily because it's unclear, especially since the term West uh, means different things to different people. Like, are you talking about the Western hemisphere or like Western culture? Uh, cause we would say, you know, like the, you know, the West, does that include like Australia, New Zealand? Uh, you know, so I, I think it's important to say, well, we're striving for, for clarity here and understanding how the Pope should be referred. I don't know. What, what do you think about this? You hit the head on the nail. I mean, the Vatican tells us exactly why it was dropped, and you you mentioned it because the title was unclear to the average person today. Um, now, you might disagree with this decision uh, by the Pope. This is a prudential decision. Again, right. you, you might think that, well, I don't think that was the best idea. Okay. But that's why it was dropped, not because of what Father Josiah says, it, and that was because this doesn't fit well with papal infallibility or conciliarism. I, 
don't know where he got that from, but the concept of the Pope being a patriarch is completely compatible with papal infallibility and with collegiality, as, as he noted there. It's perfectly compatible because there are different levels that the um, levels of authority that the Pope can exercise, patriarchal authority. He can exercise just just regular Episcopal authority in his own diocese. He can exercise his right, universal authority. He has so many a ti- titles relating right. to a lot of his levels of authority. Like I think he's also called like the primate of Italy, for mm-hmm. example, uh, the, the, the sovereign of uh, the Holy See. So there, there's, there's different ways, you're right, how he exercises his authority. But it's also confusing because if you say, oh, well, the Pope is the patriarch of the West. Well, what about people who recognize the Pope's authority who live in the East that are part of the Eastern mm-hmm. Christian Catholic churches that, mm-hmm. you know, you've got, it seems like you have a direct contradiction there that you're, you're rejecting that these people recognize uh, that he is not just one, one Bishop or one Patriarch among many. Yeah, that, that that's absolutely true. And um, as you're saying, I mean, he, he wears a lot of hats, so there, there's different levels of authority that he can right. exercise. And that's, um, so the concept of him exercising his patriarchal authority or being patriarch of the West is not incompatible with papal infallibility, but the title might be unclear today. And therefore the title, not necessarily the um, office, office was dropped. Right. Um, so I, I don't know where Father Josiah got that from. I, I, I did not find that to be accurate. Yeah. All right. Let's check this out. I said, this Fatima revelation, Russia is going to be converted. I said, forgive me. You really think that's what the Virgin Mary, if the Virgin Mary did this, came and appeared to these, these girls, do you really think that's what she meant? I said, because we Orthodox think that's utter, total nonsense. And he said to me, he said, oh, he has a very high voice. He said, oh, Father, I know something about this. He goes, I am personally acquainted with the youngest of the daughters. And I have corresponded with her on many occasions. I think she just died within this last year. He said, I wrote her that very question. I said, I said, tell me what you said. He said, I wrote her a letter and I said, did the Virgin Mary, in your understanding, mean that Russia would become Roman Catholic or that Russia would return to her Orthodox Christianity? And the daughter, according to Dom Pio, wrote back and said, it's my understanding that the Virgin Mary meant that Russia would return to its Orthodox Christianity. Very interesting. I asked him if he was going to uh, publish the letter. <laughs> It'd be very nice if he would. It'd be very, very nice if he would. Uh. Okay, so this is something I think, and it's interesting when we talked earlier about how we view the Orthodox different than other non-Catholics. So like when we talk about uh, reaching out to the Orthodox, we talk about union, unification, reunion, rather than other terms like evangelization, which we'd use for non-Christians and frankly, even for some Protestants who don't, who don't have the sacraments like we do, even, even though it's not canonically proper, it, it feels almost proper in some sense. But here we talk about union and what are things that can divide us. And I think one thing that can be difficult, honestly, is the difference in piety, like just how different pious practices in the West versus the East that can almost feel like a culture shock. And things like certain Marian apparitions or Fatima, something that's very popular in the, in the West, uh, in the East, it might, might not be, it might be seen in, in a different light, especially this issue of Fatima, the conversion of Russia. So here Father Josiah is talking about, he had a conversation with a, a Catholic, I don't remember exactly who, but talking, and the question is raised, and I think the question you and I need to address is, how should Eastern Orthodox look at the apparitions of Fatima and understanding the conversion of Russia and the place of the Russian Orthodox Church. So what would your response be? A lot of Orthodox see the apparition as demonic, and I, I do think that's problematic. But yeah. those who have um, more of a... Well, they're not bound uh, to accept it. If they did come right, back right, right. with us, they wouldn't have to. Right, <laughs> right. right. Um, it's still hard. <laughs> yeah, now, now, of course, we do have some liturgical... Um, veneration of of the virgin here when in relation to this uh private revelation um so that that 
that would cause some problems if they absolutely rejected it. Um, why do you think? Why do you think they they find it to be demonic? Um, you know, some of the reasons why I've heard before is they they, for example, some would say that we are without grace, and so the Virgin Mary would not. Um, come and, and say these things. That's oh. clearly not the virgin. That has to be a demon oh. uh, imitating to be the virgin because that, we're, we're graceless Latins. Yeah, that, well, that's interesting because that's what a lot of, when I read Protestant apologists, mm. uh, mm-hmm. ones who will defend the resurrection, for example, mm-hmm. and a lot of them will admit, you're right, there's just as much or more evidence for Marian apparitions than for the appearances of Jesus to the apostles. Mm-hmm. So like they'll admit, yeah, this did happen, but their theology they can't accept it. So I guess it's hard that for a certain a fair number of Orthodox, they mm-hmm. would think that we are, uh, because I guess that's what's hard for our listeners to wrap their heads around, that it seems like we are, are more understanding and willing to see a stronger bond between us and the Orthodox mm-hmm. than many of the Orthodox are willing to see in reverse. Is that the case? Yes, because I do think that one of the main reasons is we have an objective way to identify true versus false propositions doctrinally. Mm -hmm. Um, So we have a magisterium that is able to settle some of these issues. So we we have an objective way of identifying, Okay, well, um, could there be people out there that are not formally Catholic, but are still related to the church that are still perhaps imperfectly participating in the grace uh, graces that are in the church? Whereas with orthodoxy, there really isn't that objective magisterial mechanism to settle these questions. So it's it's kind of a free for all. Some are going to have a similar view to what you find in Catholicism. Some are going to have the grace spigot view that basically says outside of the formal bounds of Eastern Orthodoxy, there is no grace. Others are going to just say, well, outside of the visible bounds, we just don't know. You'll, you'll find a lot of different views out there. But for those who say that there is no grace outside of the visible bounds of Eastern Orthodoxy, they're generally going to be the ones who take that harsh tone when it comes uh, to this prophecy. Okay. Uh, what do you think those who might be more open as Orthodox understanding Marian apparitions at Fatima uh, could they hold the view that that what Fatima is talking about is related to just Russia just mm-hmm. embracing uh, mm-hmm. the gospel or Christianity? Yeah. Do you think mean, that's a live option yeah. for them? It, it is an option because I, I've spoken to Fatima scholars here. I've also looked at the um, information myself. And from the best that I can tell, it, it, it's a little uncertain what exactly was meant here by uh, Russia would be converted. Are, are we just saying that they would be converted from atheism back to their Orthodox roots? That was one option that Father Josiah mentioned. Another one that he mentioned was that they would be converted to Roman Catholicism. Um, I don't think that that's what's being said, because that's definitely not even the case today with Eastern Catholics. They're not Roman Catholics in the sense that they're not Latin Catholics. They're in communion with Rome, and in that sense, Roman Catholics, but I think that's more of a misnomer. There's a third option here, and that is that um, they would return to their Orthodox roots, but then join communion with Rome. That's also a third possibility. You're able to hold to either three. Okay. All right, next up, uh, we'll get to one of the major differences here, and that would be the filioque controversy. <laughs> filioque being the part of this, the creed, the Nicene Constantinople Creed, when we say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So let's listen to Father Josiah, and we'll break it down for everyone. First, you would find that the greatest, or what St. Photius called the crown of all evils, is the heresy in the Nicene Creed that was inserted by the Catholics called the Filioque. This erroneous teaching about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father Filioque and from the Son, does tremendous uh, violence to our teaching about God. And the consequences of that heresy are immense, are immense. It wasn't the simple fact that the Pope showed extreme arrogance in altering the one ecumenical creed of the Church that the fathers who articulated it said could not be changed even in a syllable. Filioque. That's four (coughs) syllables. Um, It wasn't just that. That 
was an issue, and that's a secondary issue. In fact, today, if you were using the typical 19th and 20th century lit, uh, priestly liturgical books, what we would call in English the Book of Needs, the Ethologion, where the priest would read uh, the prayers for receiving converts from different faith traditions. If you open the page to how to receive converts from Roman Catholicism, the renunciations that are made focus on two things, the filioque and papal infallibility. Those are the two things that the priest is going to make sure in front of the whole community converts from Roman Catholicism are very clear about and they publicly renounce. Filioque, as St. Photius said, was the crown of evils. It might have been raised as early as 767, certainly in the Frankish kingdom of Charlemagne and following the Filioque was uh, posited. By the time of St. Photius, councils were held in Constantinople condemning it as a heresy even though so many Orthodox bishops and priests today do not have the courage or the conviction to maintain that filioque is a heresy. One of the popes definitively said the creed can never be changed and had the Greek and the Latin, uh, both the original Greek of the Nicene Creed and the Latin translation of the Nicene Creed without the filioque put on the doors of St. Peter. And by the way, they're no longer on the front doors, but they're preserved to this day in the Vatican. If you go to the Vatican, you can actually see these uh, copies of the Nicene Creed without the filioque that were put there by a pope who said no pope could ever possibly change the creed. Well, he was uh, proven wrong very quickly. All right. So we have two issues here. One would be the doctrine of the filioque, which is, is it theologically correct to say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So is the doctrine correct, or at the very least, is it, is it this kind of uh, massive heresy that is dividing uh, Catholicism from orthodoxy? And then number two seems to be a complaint about the history, saying, well, look, especially the, the major faux pas here is changing something in the Nicene Constantinople Creed that you cannot change. Now, everybody agrees that this was not original to the creed. It was added by the Spanish bishops, I think, what, a century and a half, two centuries later, to combat one of the heresies that, that they were dealing with there. But that gets us into issues canonically about, you know, what did, what was actually taught at these councils about the creed being changed or how it could be recited. So that's one thing I want to touch on. But I want to first bring up to you, I feel like Father Josiah sort of tips his hand a little bit when he says, kind of begrudgingly, that the vast majority of, of patriarchs or priests are not willing to stand up and say it's a heresy. I think that's kind of an indirect way of acknowledging that most Orthodox have seen that we have been able to have very successful ecumenical dialogues with one another to see that in many cases, what divides us is not theology, but it's more semantics about how we recognize that, of course, that the Holy Spirit doesn't proceed only from the Son. Everything that the Son has comes from the Father. But that doesn't mean that we just say it proceeds only from the Father or, or something like that. So I think, do you think that's right to look at that? I mean, I don't think he intended that. But mm -hmm. I think that in, in saying this, he's kind of out of step where we've made mm -hmm. a lot of ecumenical ground. Yeah, he, he's he's definitely out of step with um, a lot of Orthodox. I mean, even the North American Orthodox Catholic Consultation has this um, joint Catholic and Orthodox document called the Filioque, a church dividing issue, question um, <clears> mark. <throat> and there they note that we should not call each other heretics because this is not a matter of heresy. Um, this is more a, a matter of talking past each other when it comes to language. Um that's mostly true. I think there still are some doctrinal issues that deal with um, when it comes to the filioque, but I don't think that um, I don't think his observations are true. I don't think that it's the case that um, a lot of Orthodox today are just afraid to say that this is heresy. I think what it is is they just recognize that um, we've done better by actually listening to each other 
And whenever we've began to listen to each other, we realized that there were a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings, and we've made a whole lot of progress ever since. I think that's more behind the reason why a lot of Orthodox aren't condemning the filioque, not out of this issue of fear. There are just so many other things that were said there that just um, need to be well, addressed. But I, I think, take, take it where you want. Right. I guess the two things. We'll talk about the content <clears throat> because, I mean, we could do a whole show on filioque mm-hmm. and Trinitarian theology. Mm-hmm. I know you've covered that on Reason and Theology, so mm-hmm. I recommend people go check out Reason and Theology if you want even more super duper in depth on this issue. But I think, so we're not going to resolve that issue here in this rebuttal, but I think just trying to say, even saying this is a serious theological disagreement, mm-hmm. that that's fine. It's an important topic. But just to, to take what, what Fodius said, oh, well, this is the crown jewel of the heresies. I'm like, that's, that's very hyperbolic from, from my understanding. I, I think Orthodox who would say that, it's not just filioque. It is all of the other parts of theology of God that mm-hmm. are going from that, that, that piles on from there. So, mm-hmm. so I think it's a bit hyperbolic in that regard. You can have serious theological conversations, but you're right. This is kind of out of step from that. But let's then shift over into this historical question about um, changing. You know, saying, "Oh, well, mm-hmm. you've you've changed it. You don't have the authority to do that." Um, I don't know where he's where he's getting that. Where you know what what the angle and where he's getting that from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, let, and before I address it, let me just make a brief comment about Photius because sure. I, I thought it was interesting for him to bring him up, just because Orthodox scholars rightly note that. Um, they generally rightly note that Photius himself was very deficient when it comes to the filioque. Um, he was deficient in his understanding of the Latin concept and his understanding also of um, the Orthodox version of the filioque wasn't entirely up to par itself. That, and and I'm, I'm now speaking of maybe somebody like Gregory Palamas that you see in Eastern Orthodoxy later than Photius. He had a more developed understanding of the filioque than, um, than Photius. But more importantly, Photius, of course, um, is excommunicated um, by the Bishop of Rome. But later on in 879, he goes back into communion with Rome knowing that Rome affirms the orthodoxy of the filioque, knowing that the predecessor of the Pope that he's going into communion affirmed it, the several predecessors prior to him, and that he himself, the Pope, affirmed its orthodoxy. He goes back into communion with him, and he doesn't require the Pope to renounce the filioque. Renounce the crown jewel of the heresies or, or anything like that. Yeah, so that th- make of that whatever you want. So, yeah. well, I'll also <laughs> um, add that this that's an interesting point that you raise because it reminds me of how, like, let's say we might talk to an atheist and he'll say, mm. you know, your theology is is ridiculous and stupid. I don't believe in a in a sky daddy up in the clouds that uh, arbitrarily punishes people. And I'd say, well, well, I don't either. I, I don't mm-hmm. believe in that. So you might have uh, a thousand year, you know, a thousand years ago. Uh, Eastern or Orthodox saying, you know, I don't believe in this uh, illogical or absurd Latin Trinitarian theology. We might say mm-hmm. we, we don't believe in that either. It might be the case right. with Photius and with others. That's why we have to have this ecumenical dialogue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, w- well noted. And I also want to say as far as alteration to the creed, yeah, you'll notice he said um, explicitly that the um, there was not to be a syllable changed, and he was pinning this on an ecumenical council. Of course, he's thinking about the Council of Ephesus. Right. He's saying that the ecumenical council of Ephesus, the third ecumenical council, allegedly says that you can't even add a syllable, and then he starts to in you know list out how many syllables there are in the filioque, as if that's a, a, a cogent. Um, you know, refutation here. So right. the problem is that's actually not what Ephesus says. What Ephesus says is that um, they should not compose a different faith as a rival to that established by the Holy Fathers, different faith. And so what you have is um, Anselm of Havelberg, for example, in his debate with Nicetus of Nicomedia um, in the Middle Ages when they're debating the Filioque, this is a Catholic and an Orthodox debating, he, whenever this objection is raised, he rightly notes that we're not changing the faith. This isn't a different faith. Right. This is simply a clarification, just like you have with 
Constantinople I adding clarifications and, in fact, actually adding to the creed of Nicaea, uh, because, of course, the creed that we confess and call the creed of Nicaea is actually a combination of Nicaea and Constantinople I. Um, you also right. see this at, at Florence. They're saying it's not a different faith. We're not adding substantially to the creed. We're just simply clarifying it. And if we can't do that, then these other councils that clarified some matters to Nicaea's creed, uh, they couldn't do that either. Yeah, that's a good point. That's why you noticed earlier, that's why I was saying that the nice, we usually say for short, the Nicene creed, but mm-hmm. the creed that we that we recite is not the creed from the Council of Nicaea. It mm-hmm. properly speaking, it's the Nicene Constantinople creed. Mm-hmm. So if you could mm-hmm. never, if you could never alter any of the creeds, even a syllable of them, you wouldn't have the creeds that, that we that we say today. But I think also people need to understand here is that there, there once again, there is room for dialogue and accommodation because even in the Eastern Catholic churches, the filioque the, from the, the and the son is not said in the creed. And, the, mm-hmm. and it's not said when the Pope can celebrates a divine liturgy with one of the patriarchs. It, it, we're not denying it, right? but we're just not saying that part of a creed where yep. there's a history of long tension related to it. Yeah, and that's a disciplinary decision. I think that that's perfectly legitimate. As long as we understand, affirm the orthodoxy of the filioque, which we right. do, um, then that that's not a problem. Now, he also made another note on a related point here about a pope actually agreeing that the filioque could never be altered. That's not true. He's actually thinking of Pope John VIII. This is a misunderstanding. Pope John VIII was confirming the Council of 879, and the Council of 879 um, under Photius was said this, adding nothing, falsifying nothing for subtraction and addition when no heresy is stirred up by the ingenious fabrications of the evil one. What it's saying is, you can't add to the creed when no heresy is stirred up. And then it also qualifies what it means by add. It says, as for the act of changing with falsified words, it's talking about changing the concept, the substance, falsifying the creed, changing what it actually means substantially, and doing these changes when no heresy is being stirred up. Now, of course, Catholics are going to rightly note heresy was stirred up. That's exactly why the filioque was put into the creed to begin right. with, is because there was a heresy stirred up from uh, particular Arians, and this was actually to strengthen the deity of Christ um, in the creed. So the Pope actually did not say it could never under any circumstance be changed. It, he just simply agreed to when no heresy is stirred up and with falsified words. Now, uh, one, one other point. He says the same Pope put two silver shields at at the Vatican with the uh, filioque being um, not in the creed. Also not true. It wasn't even John VIII. It was Leo III that he's thinking about. Curious thing about Pope Leo III. He actually affirms explicitly the filioque. He says Mm -hmm. that it shouldn't be added to the creed. And this is a prudential decision that he made. It shouldn't be added to the creed, but he affirms the filioque explicitly. And, and you right. can see that in his own letters. Um, so, yeah, okay, maybe this Pope actually wasn't in favor of adding it to the creed, but he affirmed its orthodoxy, and there were orthodox who were in communion with him. Right, so it's, a, it's disciplinary, prudential, it's a prudential mm-hmm. judgment versus Mm -hmm. the doctrine we're talking about. But I would also say it's problematic for Orthodox to be in communion with people who affirm the heresy of the filioque, if it's heresy. Right. Uh, Let's move on to the next uh, subject, another big... So we're getting into a lot of the big dividing territory here. We'll get into other issues that will seem relatively minor, but are still interesting to discuss. But I, I I I would say that the big ones that divide Catholic and Orthodox, filioque, though not as much as it once was, but a lot of this is going to really come down to the to the papacy. I mean, it it always has it has been. So we'll talk now about the universal primacy of the Pope in his role in the Church. Following that is the concept of universal primacy, the thought that has developed in the West, especially in Rome, that the Bishop of Rome is not just Peter's successor, but Peter's personal presence on the earth. It couldn't have helped that when Pope Leo I, the great saint, had his tome read at the Fourth Council in Chalcedon, all of those who were listening said, 
Peter has spoken through Leo. Forgive me, but I think that went to the Pope's heads because that became fundamental Catholic doctrine that the Pope no longer uh, was just the successor of Peter, but his personal presence, maintaining his authority. And therefore, over the second half of the first millennium, there grew um, ideas in the papacy that the Pope didn't have just jurisdiction over his area, but that he also could meddle in the affairs of the Eastern Patriarchs in Antioch and Constantinople, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and elsewhere. Not just as a last court of appeal, which is traditional, not just maintaining a primacy of honor, but asserting a universal jurisdiction, which has grown to such a height that today, in the Catholic Church, no bishop in any part of the Catholic world becomes a bishop except by the Pope's choice. The, that, that centrality of uh, authority is something totally foreign to the Orthodox world. Uh, the idea that one bishop would determine all the bishops in all the rest of the world is just, uh, forgive me, absolutely foul. Absolutely foul to the Orthodox mind. So all right. So we have two issues here. One is the historical question on what was the role of the Bishop of Rome, uh, his role in relation to the other patriarchs, the other bishops. Then the second one that's brought up here at the end is more of a question of discipline, which is concern about, well, how are people elevated to certain episcopates or patriarchates? You know, how, how, you know where should the control lie in various ways to who becomes a bishop or a metropolitan of certain areas? So we'll, we'll talk about that second. But first, talking here just about uh, the, the role, the universal primacy of the Pope, what he mentioned about Leo's tone, this would be at the Council of Chalcedon in the middle of the fifth century when Pope Leo's tome was read and everyone exclaims, Peter has spoken through Leo. His reply, it reminds me of this Iglesio Necristo, uh, Iglesia Necristo uh, preacher. This is essentially the Jehovah's Witnesses of the Pacific Islands. If you, if you aren't familiar with them, Iglesia Necristo, they, they deny the deity of Christ. They're like the Jehovah's Witnesses of uh, Eastern Asia, Southeast Asia, Asian islands. And he did a debate with Carl Keating, the founder of Catholic Answers, about the deity of Christ. And Carl said, well, what about John 20, 28? Thomas says to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And this guy, Jose Ventilacion, has got this big grin on his face. He says, Thomas was wrong. Or there's that you people say like Thomas just blurted stuff out and didn't even know what he was saying. You know, now, of course, I'm not saying that what the council fathers utter at Chalcedon is on par with scripture, but it, you know, it kind of reminds me of that. Like, oh, Maybe they're getting a little carried away, and now the, the Pope's getting kind of carried away. I don't see how can, you can hold to that when there are consistent uh, historical references to the Pope. And he's not, well, I guess there, that's one thing, and then I'll get your second thought. It's weird. He talks about meddling, but I've always heard a lot of Orthodox, they'll add this disclaimer. Well, well certainly the, the Bishop of Rome was a, a, final, a court of final appeal but he doesn't have universal primacy. To me, that sounds like you're trying to talk and have it both ways with the historical evidence. Does, does that make sense? It, it does. Let, let me first deal with the in, initial part where he was speaking about uh, Peter's personal presence. He says that, you know, Leo hears what Chalcedon says, and it just goes to his head. Well, first of all, Pope Leo is a saint in the Orthodox Church, so I'm not, I'm not sure that that was the best Thing to say, but putting that to the side, um, that's definitely not the case because prior to 451, the Council of Chalcedon, Pope Leo already thought his tome was definitive, which is um, one of the reasons why we say that's one of the examples of um, an ex cathedra teaching, the tome of Leo. He already thought that his teaching settled the matter for the universal church. Um, he, he wasn't listening to the Chalcedonian fathers and, oh, they're, they're speaking well of me. Well, now that's going to my head. No, he, he already thought that he had this supremacy even and, prior to And them. also their acclamation is not simply because, wow, this is a really great tome we're hearing. Mm -hmm. Way to go. It's a recognition of authority speaking in a definitive way. 
Yeah, the, the Petrine Authority. And um, of course, what, what he's saying is, well, you know, prior to Leo, nobody really thought that Peter exercises a personal presence in his successors. That's odd because the Council of Ephesus ex- says exactly that in session three. Here you have Philip, the papal legate, who is the representative of the Pope who speaks on his behalf at the council, because of course the Pope's not present at the council. Here's what he says before the council fathers at Ephesus, which they accept. They don't reject this. He says, no one can doubt. Yes, it is known unto all ages. This St. Peter, the Prince of the Apostle, the pillar of the faith and ground of the church, has received the keys of the kingdom from our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, the power of forgiving and retaining sins was given to him up to this present time, lives and exercises judgment in the persons of his successors. There's a lot going on here, but he's clearly taking the the passages from the New Testament, applying it to the successors of Peter, and specifically saying that it is Pope Celestine. He actually says that a little bit later in the council. If you're curious, well, who are these successors? He explicitly says it's Pope Celestine and the bishops of Rome. And he says that Peter lives and exercises judgment in his successors. That's Peter's personal presence. And that is proclaimed at the Council of Ephesus, and they accept it, which is why you'll find educated Orthodox scholars like like Schmemann, they'll they'll read the councils because this isn't just Ephesus. This is also Chalcedon and the Sixth Council, Seventh Council. You'll they'll make claims there about the Pope that are in accord with our papal claims, but are heresy to modern day Orthodox. Uh, that's that's why these scholars, these Orthodox scholars, will say, look, the papal claims were openly proclaimed at these ecumenical councils, and the fathers did seemingly give approval to it, but you know they didn't really mean it, and then he goes to try to explain it away. Um, but it, it, it's kind of embarrassing to note the ecumenical, ecumenical council says exactly what Father Josiah says isn't the case that they don't that they don't that they say don't or say. they didn't affirm. And, yeah, and, and I think this yeah. is important. Uh, and I would also recommend to our listeners um, a lot of great different books on this subject. In my book, The Case for Catholicism, I have a section on the historical development of the papacy where I talk about very early on when you have cases like Pope Clement or Pope, Pope Clement being sought out, being sought out, not meddling, being sought out to resolve a dispute with a church in the East, possibly while the Apostle John even is still alive, this is in the first century, or Pope Victor uh, having threatening to having the authority and threatening to excommunicate Eastern churches. Uh, to me, I, I don't see that. I mean, there, we once again could do a whole show on all these topics on that historical evidence, but mm. I don't think it's just a primacy of honor. It's not just a first among equals when you look at the historical evidence. It's more than that. Pope Leo himself, since we're talking about Pope Leo, is a a good example because he meddled or interfered in the affairs, if you will, of the Orthodox, especially in the Sea of Constantinople, liturgically, juridically, and doctrinally. Specific examples can be given for each one of those. He did that, and Constantinople acquiesced to it. They recognized that he had the authority to do that. In fact, Leo annuls a canon from the Council of Chalcedon with his authority of St. Peter, and Constantinople bows to it. So they recognize that he had authority much more than what Father Josiah is admitting here. Now, as far as a last court of appeal, um, yeah, you'll sometimes hear that because you, you do have a council of Sardica where some of the Eastern bishops are talking about, okay, well, Rome, um, you know, we, we all agree that Rome will be a last court of appeal for us if we ever have a dispute. Is that right? And all the council fathers say, yeah, that's right. Well, there's, there's no problem with that appellate, appellate structure. That, that's compatible with the papal claims. There's no problem there. But is that all that the Pope really was? Is right. it, when, when it, In relation to the East, he's just this kind of appellate court? No. Because, for example, um, again, talking about Pope Celestine that we were mentioning prior to Pope Leo, mm-hmm. when Cyril of, of Alexandria, the Patriarch of Alexandria, writes to Pope Celestine asking Pope Celestine to condemn and excommunicate from the universal church, the um, patriarch of Constantinople, who was Nestorius at the time. Whenever he did this, there was no, there was no um, intermediate judgment that was made. And now an appeal has been lodged. No, Cyril just goes straight to the Pope. He he doesn't even go to an ecumenical council. He just goes straight to the Pope and ask the Pope to settle the matter. Right. Because Um, because he has this, 
because uh, he has a primacy because yeah. he, he has a he's not he's not just a fail safe option when the metropolitans can't agree amongst yeah. each other or the patriarchs can't agree he's not he's not the tie breaking he's not like the vice president in the senate who yeah. cast the tie breaking vote or he can do that but he's yeah. not merely that he's in not merely case, he's not merely yeah that. and in i think the case of what, sorry i, I no, think no, go ahead. Important, what's important here is and i think you're making a really good point is that sometimes the orthodox will make a valid claim to say well the pope uh, you know, Catholics don't mention that the Pope, that this is a role that he has. And we could say, yes, absolutely, that is a role of the papacy. But it's not only consigned to that particular level of authority or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he, he does have that authority to be that court of appeal, but he also has a higher authority than that, as we see in the case of Pope Celestine with Cyril of Alexandria. And there are many, many, many other cases uh, that you can point to that, in fact, involve ecumenical councils. That's what's more embarrassing, in my opinion, for the Orthodox position. Mm -hmm. They're venerating the councils, yet these councils are affirming a higher ecclesiology of the papacy that than any Catholic today would maintain. Right. It's like when Protestants affirm Nicaea, Ephesus, Chalcedon for mere Christian doctrines, mm -hmm. but not for the Catholic doctrines the councils also uphold. You know, right. Like, oh, well, of course, the divinity of Christ and all this. Uh, one last thing before we move on. Uh, th and this is a, is, you know, a touchy subject with authority and uh, prudential judgments that have to be made in mm -hmm. seeking reunion with the East. Uh, you know, there is this question that uh, even people in the West have raised. And I think that there have been recent in recent years with John Paul II and Benedict have talked about how, you know, can there be differences in how bishops are selected for or, or mm -hmm. you know, people are selected for different uh, sees and things like that? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think there's room for accommodation on that? Absolutely. And, and I'm not the only one who thinks that. I think, in fact, a, a great deal of Catholics would admit that um, though the, the centralized structure of determining who's going to be a bishop uh, when, when it comes to the papacy, though there were some good historical reasons for that development, right. it is disciplinary and it's probably not fitting for today. There were good reasons to have that back during the time of the Reformation. It's, it's right. no longer necessarily the case today. So I think that you could be still a good Catholic, affirm Vatican I, and say, yeah, maybe it should be a little less hands-on. So, so maybe it might be something like uh, a local, you know, diocese, archdiocese, uh, patriarchate, whatever, you know, whatever area, uh, they, so they're able to locally select who their bishop will be and then that's something that the Pope ratifies, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, they, that's already the case, of course, with Eastern Catholics in, in, some, in some of the Eastern Catholic churches. Mm -hmm. They actually decide who's going to be the bishop, and the Pope just ratifies it. I think in the case of a patriarchate, they determine. And, um, but uh, I'd have to double check that. I, I'd sure. have to look at there. But, um, but, but the point is, it is a little bit less hands-on when it comes to the Eastern Catholic churches. But even in those cases, I think that you could say um, the Pope could give them a little bit more um, authority in determining who's going to be the bishop without perhaps ratifying it. Could, it. Yeah, yeah, it could even be a case where the Pope just reserves the right to nullify in an extreme circumstance. In an extreme case, yeah. Yeah, so that he doesn't, yeah, and so you're right, it could even be there to recognize his universal authority, but they select, and then he just only nullifies it when he believes, when he's just, has just cause that the person is not fit or something. It's, it's like the, the direct centralized model, but kind of in, in reverse for its purpose of just, the, you know, in the Reformation, the goal here is not necessarily to get the best people in, but to keep the worst people out. <laughs> yeah. I think that that's reasonable, and, and I do believe the papacy is heading in that direction. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Now the question, another one, this one doesn't come up as much, I think, among uh, lay Catholics and Orthodox. Well, it does. It does come up, I, I think, more. A lot of Catholics, when they think about what divides Catholics and Orthodox, would be the Pope and Filioque, but they may not see that there are you know, different understandings, or at least articulations of grace itself uh, can sometimes be a stumbling block. So let's play that. As we continue down the list past the filioque, universal primacy, infallibility, we come to more dogmatic realities, like the teaching of the Catholic Church about what grace is, and, that, and the rejection of the teaching of the Fathers about the uncreated light. 
the result of teaching that grace is, is a substance of sort, different from God, you end up with a denial of the traditional orthodox practice of hesychasm or the use of pure prayer in which you can have communion with God directly and see the uncreated light. This is, of course, the, the drive of our leaders is to be with God and to have the experience of Mount Tabor in their life, to know him and to commune with his light. And this is something explicitly denied by the Roman Catholic Church. Our hesychasts, including great saints like St. Saint Gregory Palamas, are considered heretics by the Catholic Church today because they taught that we can commune not with God's essence, but with his divine energy, and that that divine energy, much as the heat and rays of the sun are different than the sun, but are also the sun, that divine energy is certainly God and his presence. How could our monastic tradition ever be reconciled with Catholic dogma, as long as they maintain a teaching about created grace and a refutation of hesychasm? All right. I am certainly no expert in Eastern monasticism and mysticism. And I think a lot of people listening to the discussion about the, the, the Tabor light and uncreated grace, it might be unfamiliar to them. The, the, one, the only thing, that, well, the one thing that really perked my ears was his claim that in the Catholic Church, Greg, St. Gregory of Palamas is just a heretic full stop. And I think that that's a, that's a gross oversimplification. And I know there was a time when his, his books had to be removed uh, from you know, the, the, the Catholic library, from the libraries, not, not deemed safe to read. But you, when you read modern theologians, uh, they talk about a revival of the thought of St. Gregory of Palama. So that's, that's just, that's the one thing that I, that I noticed. Uh, but I would be interested to hear your thoughts that, it, that it, it seems to me, at least from the outset, this seems like uh, a concern blowing out of proportion of where th th this happens also with, with Protestants as well, that Catholic theology has, has firm boundaries, but it also has degrees of latitude on different theological questions to articulate different things related to them. I don't know if that might apply in this case or not. It does apply because um, the debate that takes place here between Palamism is with Thomism, right? Um, and which is not the, identical to Catholicism. I think that's right. where the problem lies. Yeah, the Catholic Church allows for you to take a different position than the Thomist perspective on this issue. Um, perhaps you could take the Scotus position. You could also, as a Catholic in good standing, take the Palamite position. The reason why is Eastern Catholics have on their liturgical calendar St. Gregory Palamas as a saint. Right. They venerate them, and they're Catholics in full communion. And Rome has approved this veneration for Eastern Catholics. So it's it's Rome giving this implicit canonization to Palama. So he's not considered a heretic. In fact, he's considered a saint among some of um, our Catholic churches. Um, I don't think that he could legitimately be called a, a heretic because of that. But again, more importantly, his view his understanding here of hesychasm and what we call palamism is actually something a Catholic could maintain instead of the Thomist view or instead of um, the Scotus view, which is kind of a bridge between uh, the Thomist view and palamism without having to get into all of the details. Point is, he's wrong here. You could accept the, he the hesychastic view. Um, you can accept Palamas as a saint and be in perfectly good standing in the Catholic Church. I also have some comments I could offer about uncreated grace versus created grace if, if you want me to go into it. Well, we, we still have a lot to move through, but it, it is important. So if we want a, a brief primer on, on the difference and how I might resolve it, well, why not? These, <laughs> my mm -hmm. last rebuttal video was nearly three hours long, and mm. this is important stuff. So yeah, let's, let's have a brief primer on it. I, I, would, I would just briefly say that he, he is misunderstanding things. We are not saying that grace is created um, in, in the sense that he understands it, because what he's saying is, um, well, that makes God created. No. In, in fact, here's what Father John Harden, a Roman Catholic, says about 
uncreated versus created grace. He speaks of created grace as basically our experience that we have with God is something that happens in time. I mean, we become a new creature in Christ in time. I haven't existed for all eternity. I'm not a new creature in Christ in eternity past. That happened at my baptism. That's something that happened in time. And in insofar as my experience with God um, has happened in time, we can speak of created grace. But the grace that I'm receiving is uncreated because it's God himself. Father Hardin says, but the gift that is conferred on a creature in these acts is uncreated. So the gift is uncreated. God's uncreated. But my experience of that gift is something right. that's created. That's what we're talking about when we speak of created grace. This is just a very, very basic misunderstanding that um, could have been dispelled very quickly. Right. In distinctions, my distinctions, <laughs> distinctions. Yeah. That's, that's the key that always has to be made. And I think that this, this could happen. And this especially when we're engaging with Orthodox or even other Protestants to know that there are schools of thought within Catholicism. We're the universal church, not just universal in culture, but we're also universal. Like, you know, think about the relationship between uh, foreknowledge and, and free will, like the, the Thomists and uh, uh, Molinists will have a different view. And there's even other views beyond Thomism and Molinism mm-hmm. that don't mm-hmm. get talked about a lot. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the, the church, do, you know, allows... Uh, this diversity, as long as you stay within the guardrails of orthodoxy. And that's why we need to have these conversations to show, hey, you might disagree with not the Catholic Church, but one school of Catholic thought. And so that, that's important for people to, to understand. And I think this is going to also come up here in our next section about purgatory, because I just mm-hmm. did a rebuttal video uh, engaging uh, Dr. Gavin Ortland on, mm-hmm. on, uh, on purgatory. And, uh, and he talked about the Orthodox and their views. And in my research for that, it seems to me like, especially if you compare to other issues, we're, we're actually very, 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 it's very close. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it reminds me of, of semantics with, with Filioque. So let's, but let's yeah. uh, jump into that. So here mm-hmm. we go. Of course, there are many soter- soteriological issues that are on our lists. Purgatory, the concept that there is Uh, a unique fire that is a purifying fire, not a consuming fire, not a destroying fire, not the fire of hell, and not paradise, not the fire of paradise, which is divine light, but a third reality uh, that is the destination for most believers who have put their faith in Christ but have not satisfied the demands of God's justice by repentance and deeds of repentance and therefore must go to this place in order to be prepared over years, sometimes hundreds of years, to be able to be fit for heaven. Now the concept of purgatory certainly uh, appeared before the schism and there were a number of really great Western saints who maintained this teaching. Okay, so I, I see here uh, already, I mean, it sounds like some fundamentalist Protestants mm-hmm. that I might engage, like the objection to purgatory, that you think there's, there's going to be this fire that we're going to burn mm-hmm. in for hundreds of years before we can go to heaven. Mm-hmm. That is not a, a, a defined teaching of the doctrine of purgatory. Now, there are theologians who have speculated through church history about what purgatory is like, just like mm-hmm. there have been theologians that have speculated about what hell is like or what heaven is like. But those speculations are not definitive teaching. The teaching, as uh, affirmed, I want to say it's around what, paragraph like 1030, 1031 in the mm-hmm. Catechism of the Catholic Church, just says that what purgatory is, is that it is the purification of the elect so they are capable of entering in heaven. Uh, mm-hmm. So when you look at least what the catechism says, it doesn't talk about the fire of purgatory. Mm-hmm. It doesn't talk about mm-hmm. how purgatory. It doesn't also talk about how long it is. And yeah. when you read Aquinas, when you read other Catholic scholars throughout history, they recognize in the afterlife, time works differently. So we can't gauge purgatory as having the same temporal duration as this life. Paul talks mm-hmm. about us being changed in the twinkling of an eye. So, What's hard for me is that Father Josiah picks like, well, we, and this is the same thing, like when you have St. Mark of Ephesus, 
uh, combating, you know, addressing the Council of Florence on purgatory. He's saying, well, we in the East, we don't believe in a, a, a expiation by a purifying fire. Well, we don't hold to in the West that it has to be that. Some people have, mm-hmm. but it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be that. But but Mark of Ephesus does say that what's interesting is that in his, in his homily on purgatory, he says that the the inner torment of the soul in the in the state after death to prepare it for heaven from the east the greek view the eastern view he says that's worse pain than any kind of external fire mm-hmm. so it's hard for me as i feel like look we both agree east and west that after death if you are still attached to sin you will need purification now the difference might be well you guys say it's a punishment mm-hmm. well i mean i'd say guys I think punishment's a fine word if you did something bad and then you accrue something bad because of it. And we, you undergo this unpleasant process to be purified and prepared for heaven. I just feel like we're so close. He's just picking differences that aren't a defined part of the doctrine. But. Yeah, spot on. I mean, the, <clears throat> the issue of a material fire um, is not defined. It's not anything that anyone is bound to believe as a Catholic. So in my opinion, the vast majority of Orthodox criticisms against purgatory are irrelevant because they all focus on the material fire aspect. Now, he did mention there about um, being, you know, we, we think that these people are in purgatory hundreds of years before they see God as if that was a problem for him. It's interesting you brought up Mark of Ephesus. Mark of Ephesus at Florence thinks that the righteous, not not the damned, the righteous will not enjoy God until the great and final judgment. So right. that that's more than a few hundred years. So I, right. I just thought, well, if, if, if you're going to quibble over that, I mean, you probably wouldn't like Mark of Ephesus, who doesn't think that the righteous see God at all all until right. the final judgment right. whereas we would say well once one is purified they they enter into the beatific vision they see god and enjoy god mark of ephesus wants to say they don't see god at all um and they don't enjoy god and have beatitude until yeah after the resurrection so so once again i feel like when it comes to purgatory it's really it's just like the name like i don't like that it's yeah. a Latin purgatorium it's augustine it's a latin name fine take you can have you can have different names like in the east we have different names for the sacrament the divine the mysteries mysterion the mysteries in the east that's what's great about a universal church you can have your own terms as long as we stay within the guardrails of orthodoxy but Mm -hmm. i think this will go a little bit further into it that i think what in the east they might be concerned about the punishment aspect of purgatory which i still think can be reconciled uh with the idea of a purification model uh is this idea of the church's authority to remit the temporal punishment related to sin and mm-hmm. you know the the indulgences and and things like that so let's mm-hmm. but it exploded in the middle ages in the west and became the structure for a whole approach to uh relations between the clergy and the lady in which the clergy um, marketed indulgences and raised lots of money on the concept that this money would go to help people who you loved in purgatory uh, so that they could get out. Martin Luther was very wise in his 95 theses to address right away the concept that if the Pope actually has authority to limit or absolutely exculpate any deceased person's time in purgatory, then why doesn't he just do it out of love right now without money? Anyway, it was a great, was a great point. Our defender of orthodoxy, St. Mark of Ephesus, who was at the attempted reunion council of Ferrara Florence in 1438, left us, left the church, four beautiful homilies against purgatory where the orthodox teaching is very clearly laid out with regards to this. I think the red flag that pops up for a lot of people when they hear indulgences is they say, oh, money, indulgence, get out of Mm -hmm. hell. Mm -hmm. The church has gone completely bonkers and corrupt. And I think what's important to say, let's pump the brakes a little bit, especially with people that are close to us, like the Orthodox, and go back to someone like St. John Chrysostom and others in the East and others who would say, well, what can we do? Because the Orthodox are also very clear. And uh, Father Josiah mentions this in the talk. I didn't include this clip. Uh, I do include the clip in my video responding to Dr. Ortland. 
uh, that the Orthodox uh, pray for 40 days after the deceased uh, to help them on their journey. That the, in the Callistos, where everybody affirms this, the prayers of the living do help the deceased. And not just the prayers of the living, but giving alms, doing good works on behalf of the dead to to help them, to carry their burden, to make an offering on their behalf. So if you start there, especially as someone who's close to us, you know, look at these fathers who affirm when we give alms, that's a way to help uh, deceased souls. So some of them, uh, I think it was Chrysostom who said there were certain deceased souls that, you know, the, the faithful departed who have died, we, we would pray for them in the liturgy. But let's say someone who died without baptism, the best you could do is go and give alms on their on their behalf or something like that. So the problem is you have an indulgence, which is, well, you say a, a certain prayer, you do something to make up for the temporal aspects of temporal punishments related to sin. You can't make up for the eternal cost or punishment, but you can do something to make up for the temporal effects. You know, saying a certain prayer, doing a good work, like giving to the poor. The problem is, you know, you're, you're, if you're a corrupt Christian, you just got extra cash, you, you think you can just buy your way out of these uh, these punishments you would normally have in purgatory in the afterlife. And so I, I think that if we dial it back a bit, especially talk about prayers for the dead, almsgiving for the dead, maybe that's a way to help the, our, our, our Eastern brethren see there, there is sensibleness related to this. I don't know if that's helpful. It's very helpful because that, that's what I was thinking as well. Tobit 12.9 says this, alms di- almsgiving saves from death and purges away every sin. Now, of course, the um, Orthodox are <clears throat> generally going to accept uh, the book of Tobit in their canon. Some, some Orthodox reject the Deuterocanonicals, but um, majority of them are going to accept them. Um, right. But <clears throat> here again, it notes almsgiving saves from, saves from death and purges away every sin. Now, you know, one could rhetorically ask in the same way that he quoted Martin Luther, well, if almsgiving saves from, saves from death and purges away every sin, why doesn't God merely uh, purge away every sin and save people from death without alms? Right. right. It's interesting. His objection, which borrowing from Luther to the Pope is, you know, well, if the Pope, if the Pope has the power to do X, why doesn't he do X? Well, God had, you know, that's not what God has given the church uh, as its prerogative to do much like, I mean, you could turn the question and atheists can turn it back around to God. Why yeah. didn't God do this or that in the economy of salvation or the forgiveness of sins? So it's not a road. I don't think they, I don't think they should go down. Yeah, if if God loves everyone and has the power to save everybody, uh, but knows that some people are going to reject him, why did uh, he not just create a world where nobody rejects him in the first place? I mean, right. we, we can level these objections all day long. I don't think they're very helpful. I also don't think they're consistent with the Orthodox perspective at all. I think it was it was not a very um, fair critique. Now, <clears throat> I, I also want to make a connection here. There sure. there is a connection between the concept of indulgences and the early practices in the early church of the penitential system. I mean, of course, the the local bishop did have the authority to dispense or mitigate and lessen a person's um, penance period. If they committed some grave sin, they were barred from communion for a certain period of time. The bishop did have the authority to dispense with it altogether or to mitigate it. And here's a question. Well, if he could dispense with it altogether, why didn't he just do that for everybody? Well, anyways, that that but that was also, some but that's also helpful because you're saying mm-hmm. look if you got if if uh, the orthodox will admit that the bishops in the early church had the ability to remit temporal punishment mm-hmm. for sin before death mm-hmm. why wouldn't they have that same authority after death what's you know what yeah. if we're in christ christ has conquered death and that's the key, because what you see there in the patristic era is that they have this authority over the temporal punishments in this life. What they're going to say is, but what you're talking about is in another, in the next life. And yes, that's a concept that you don't necessarily see explicit in the patristic era. But I do think it's a development out of that concept and also the concept of papal supremacy. When you put those together, it does naturally develop into this concept. So I do think it's legitimate, but I'm willing to concede there, there is some development here. I'm not saying indulgences are 100% seen in the way that they're seen in the mid- medieval ages there sure. in the juristic era. Sure. All right. Now moving on, we'll talk about we'll talk about Mary, or as we'd say in the East, the, you know, the Theotokos, the God-bearer, and this is hard here. A lot of people say, oh, Orthodox and Catholics are so far apart on Mary. I say, well, 
are, are we really? I think once again, it's, it's going to be a vocabulary issue, and especially with the Immaculate Conception. It's going to be piggybacking the vocabulary issue related to original sin. So let's take a look. The Immaculate Conception, which was articulated by the Catholic Church that the Virgin Mary was conceived in a way uh, unlike the rest of us, and that she actually was free of original sin or ancestral sin. This is not a cause of uh, her holiness. We think that that's actually an insult because if the Virgin Mary was not dealing with the same inheritance of death and corruption and bentness that we all have as sinners, which we can't help but pass on to our progeny, which is why we bring them to baptism as children and so that they can be communicated with life. If she didn't face the same liabilities, then her greatness isn't that great. It actually steals from her. But if, in fact, she, if the church says she was conceived, unlike her son, she was conceived the way that we have been conceived and yet still was as pure and exceedingly holy as she was, this, this leads us to hymn her, to praise her, and to view her as a very tangible model for us. Another interesting part here, and this was a, a clip, maybe I almost should have probably included the clip, because in the other clip I showed in a previous video where Father Josiah talks about purgatory, he says, I don't believe in purgatory, but there's, you know, there is a trial period after death that's very difficult for sinners to undergo unless you're the Virgin Mary. So there, there is an understanding of Mary's unique holiness. And maybe you can help me see if there's like a lat you know, certain uh, variety of views on how to understand the Blessed Mother in Orthodoxy. But it, it kind of reminds me a, a little bit of just like some of uh, the disputes about, uh, not, not original sin, but about whether Mary was immaculately conceived that you might have seen in the Middle Ages, for example. So what's hard is here, I feel like we're, uh, the other, well, actually, the one point that he, he brought up, I, I worry it's going to cut against him. You know, Mary's not so great if she doesn't have this uh, corrupted aspect of human nature that she's struggling against. Well, what about people who say that about Jesus, that he's not that great if he doesn't have the same sign of concupiscence or something like that? I feel like it kind of undercuts him a little bit. But what, what would you say to these points? I do, I do think that's inconsistent. I think part of the reason why he has this objection is he's identifying original sin as um, death. And he, what he basically wants to say is, look, um, if the virgin is immaculately conceived and doesn't have original sin, um, then she wasn't subject to any of the effects of the fall. That does not logically follow. In fact, it is the Catholic view. You can also see this in the well-known theologian Ludwig Ott in his Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. It is the case that you can believe the Virgin Mary, number one, died. So um, you will find our resources that say that that she was subject to sickness and things like death. So we can go ahead and dispense with that misconception. And then as far as the bentness, struggling against bentness, Ott notes that it is a free opinion. Um, this is just in the realm of opinion. You, you can take it or leave it. In the Catholic Church, you can maintain that the Virgin um, did fight against concupiscence, that she would have had it, but that she fought against it and she never gave into it. She, she never, never assented to, she never assented to it. That's a Catholic position that you can maintain. And that immediately dispels the objections that we heard from father Josiah. And more importantly, the thrust of what we're saying with the Immaculate Conception is something I think that, frankly, the Orthodox have to maintain. And that is what we're effectively saying is there was never a period in time where if she were to die in that moment, she would be cut off from God and would be in hell. There was never a time she was cut off from God's fellowship from the moment of her creation. She was always in covenant with him, Full always in communion with him. I don't know any Orthodox that would say, well, at this point, prior to the Annunciation and prior to that purification, well, if she had died at the moment, she would have gone to hell. I don't know any Orthodox who maintains that. Right. I, so I think substantially, whether an Orthodox recognizes it or not, I think they believe the Immaculate Conception. They just have a misunderstanding what we mean by it. 
Yeah, so this goes back to uh, what the church teaches and what the church allows people to believe, diversity to believe. So I would say the majority view, at least especially in the West, is that Mary was assumed alive, body and soul in the heaven. In the East, though, you have the Dormition and the Assumption. You have uh, views that Mary dies and then is assumed body and soul into heaven. But when Pope Pius XII defined the bodily Assumption, he just said at the, at the end of the course of her earthly life, there's mm-hmm. nothing in the, do- in the dogmatic definition of the bodily assumption of Mary that mm-hmm. she died and she was assumed. So you're free to believe that. And you're right, this objection, oh, well, if, you know, if, unless she was subject to original sin, she couldn't be subject to its effects like death. That's not true. Jesus was, of course, conceived without original sin, and he died on the cross. You, mm-hmm. you know, he was subject mm-hmm. to death as well. It's not like he was now suddenly invulnerable and mm-hmm. could not and could not be killed or had a body that could not suffer damage of any kind. So, yeah, I, I think that the, we'll chalk this one up to focusing on maybe certain opinions or schools of thought that Father Josiah or Orthodox disagree with. But I, I love the example that you gave up. Look, if you deny the Immaculate Conception, you're saying Mary wasn't full of grace at some points of her life and would have and if she had died, she would have been apart from God, which is mm-hmm. counterintuitive. Uh, now, some of the more of the things we're going to get into, I think, are technical issues they're minor issues so we'll go through them uh but i have an overarching criticism for them but let's listen to the first one then i'll I'll share that our fathers also mention in the lists the alteration of many of the mysteries or sacraments of the church that the latins have done and i want to just briefly mention those every one of the sacraments of the church have been altered significantly by the roman catholic church mostly since the great schism mostly post schism. I'll use just one practical example, that which we take refuge in every day, all day long, the sign of the cross. The sign of the cross is as ancient as the church. Some of our earliest testimonies uh, about its power come from the second century. Uh, St. Anthony, you know, who was born in 250, speaks about the sign of the cross being the refuge of every Christian and the greatest power against evil causing devils literally to erupt on fire. The sign of the cross is very precious to us. And we know that the sign of the cross was shared commonly between the Orthodox and the Catholics. Uh, we know that all the way through the middle of the 13th century because we have a catechism. This is post schism. We have a catechism of Pope Innocent III in which he's teaching his people how to make the cross. And he says to make the cross like we make the cross, even specifying from the right to the left. Sometime after Pope Innocent III, the sign of the cross, was changed. That change was criticized by our fathers, not that it eradicates making the sign of the cross, but that it was an alteration of one of the most fundamental practices of the church done again uh, without consideration of the entire East. All right. What's hard for me here is that this kind of feels like mountains out of molehills it's it's we ha, we 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 all st- still say the sign of the cross i think the sign of the cross is probably the most common sacramental in the catholic world uh, uh if you think of something that signifies the sacraments but it's not a sacrament itself but the only difference is of course in the west you do it from left to right in the east you do it from right to left uh one explanation i've heard as to how the change happened in the west is that people would see the bishop blessing them and he blessed them from right to left, and they're following him like in a mirror. And so when you're following the blessing the bishop gives you, you end up going left to right when he's going, uh, when he's blessing you from right to left. But my overarching criticism, and this will come up in some of the other things, is I feel like the Orthodox have said it, it wasn't fair in the past when the Pope uh, you know, or, or, or Western bishops demanded that Orthodox uh, celebrate particular Western ways of, of living out the faith, instead of tolerating even celebrating eastern diversity it's like you guys you know don't impo- you know, don't impose your sacred right you know your, your ways of living out the faith let us have ours wanting that tolerance but then turning around and saying we don't like that the west does this you know mm-hmm. we don't like that you guys do celebrate it this way and that way without letting us have our diversity as well that to me seems kind of like a double standard 
Yeah, not, not to mention the fact that there are many instances where the Byzantines impose the Byzantine way of doing things on right. non-Byzantine Christians. But yeah, both putting ways. that to the side, um, all Christians have changed the sign of the cross. Originally, the sign of the cross was traced on the forehead. It was not this large sign of the cross. Moreover, the Orthodox and Catholics. Oh, yeah, also, Tertullian. He says it on the forehead. Yeah, yeah. Moreover, Catholics and Orthodox especially have altered the sign of the cross insofar as when they hold their hands, they put three fingers together and two fingers down to represent the Trinity and the um, humanity and divinity of Christ. Of course, that was a later um, alteration very early on, but it's still an alteration to the original way of doing things. Everybody has made changes here, but he also says that we made this change without consideration to the East. I, I thought that was odd. Why would we ask the East how we as Latins make the sign of the cross for just us as Latins? If we're not saying, hey, you guys have to do this, we're just making a change. It's like saying, I have to ask my neighbor if I can rearrange my bedroom. Why, why would I ask my neighbor? I just need to know. If I'm, right. Imagine, if I'm, imagine if we made the reverse and we were all bent out of shape that in the East, they do it right to left and didn't ask us permit. If, if that was a complaint we made, Father Josiah would, would lose his head yes. at, at the idea that we were so insufferably proud that they need permission from us for how to, how to make the sign of the cross or, or something like that. Uh, let's let's continue with with uh, another one. So another uh, so now we've moved away from the major dogmatic issues, but these it still comes up. They're, they're important to people. Uh, let's talk about baptism. Baptism. Baptism has been changed both in its form and in its formula. So no longer, as is witnessed in the first millennium of the church, do the Latins baptize by trine immersion and immersion, as the apostles taught us to do baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. By the end of the first millennium, Catholics were baptizing with one immersion, which very much scared our bishops because that was an Arian practice. But in the Middle Ages, in the scholastic period, even single immersion dropped off from Catholic practice, which is almost universally not done today in the Catholic world, where baptisms are done by pouring, which is a negation of the very word baptizo itself, which means to immerse. And besides the form, the formula also was changed from the passive, the servant of God is baptized, to the active, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we are not happy with that change and think that it is uh, communicating exactly the wrong thing. Um, placing the locus of the authority to baptize in the priest instead of the priest being the agent of the Holy Spirit to do that. St. John Chrysostom fought that as early as the fourth century. So this was not unheard of, but it certainly wasn't the Latin practice until the schism. All right, so my first thoughts that jump out at me, well, my first thought is Father Josiah sounds a lot like a Baptist or, mm -hmm. or, or some oneness Pentecostal, like I'm having, I'm listening to, to do a, to do a rebuttal saying, well, baptism has to be immersed because the word baptize means immerse, but that's a fallacy, the etymological fallacy, the meaning of a word, the meaning of the words parts doesn't mean the meaning of the word as a whole, because the word baptizo is used in the new Testament to talk about the washing of hands uh, mm -hmm. without necessarily referring to the immersion of the entire body. So what's hard for me here is that he's, I guess there's two things. One, that he has the concern, oh, it has to be full immersion. Uh, but the, the New Testament never says that. The Didache, the first century, essentially the first century catechism, gives multiple methods for how to baptize. It doesn't say that. Um, it doesn't also give us that, that there's a definitive, the formula is just in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. The definitive part of the formula is not the agent itself. So I feel like he's stretching the, the secondary aspects of celebrating the sacrament as if they were the, the primary elements that have, to be, um, that have to be followed for its validity. Uh, because even, when I, I, even in the catechism and in RCIA manuals, it says, I mean, immersion it is the we in the West recognize that is the fullest form of the sacrament. We fully recognize it, even if we see that the others sprinkling, pouring that they're that they're valid. But I think it's you know falsely prioritizing these secondary elements. What do you think? 
I, I would agree with you. I would, I would also say I, I wish the Orthodox were consistent here because um, there are Orthodox that partially immerse. They don't fully immerse uh, some infants. Some do, some don't. So I, I think there's some inconsistency there. And as you noted, baptizo doesn't necessarily mean immerse. Some, sometimes it could mean immerse. Sometimes it means dip partially, right. not fully. Um, That's a good it, point you raised though about the, the infants. Cause like, I remember we had our infant, he was fully baptized, but if you made mm -hmm. that like, a universal regulation you have to fully immerse three times mm -hmm. there's a lot of priests that feel super uncomfortable yeah. fully immersing an infant and you'd have a lot of hesitation about baptism we, you never want to have something like that the point of baptism to me when you see in in sacramental theology and canon law is that there are as wide parameters as possible at least for its validity because it's the door to the sacraments and you want as many people as possible baptized. So you remove as few obstacles to baptism, sorry, remove as many obstacles to baptism as you can. Mm -hmm. You know, and just a point of fact, whenever, when I was Orthodox, my second son was baptized Orthodox. And again, he was partially immersed uh, because of that very fear that you mentioned there at the beginning. Uh, some priests are going to be afraid to fully immerse an infant. But um, he, he mentioned something there about the formula being changed in the West from the active, I'm sorry, from the passive to the active. I've never heard of that. I don't know of anything that would substantiate that. I have right. seen things contrary to that in the West. So I don't know where he's getting his facts from. I, I wish he would substantiate some of these things. Um, and, and then I, I would say just frankly, more importantly than this formula debate is the major, major elephant in the room. And that is the fact that Orthodox rebaptize some, some Orthodox rebaptize other Christians, some, not all. Historically, they've rejected rebaptism, rightly so, but some Orthodox no longer do that and perform a sacrilegious ceremony where they rebaptize a baptized Christian. And it is sacrilege, according to St. Vincent of Lorenz and the constant testimony of Christians. Right. I think that's a bigger issue to address than this, frankly. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to me. It's hard from our perspective. We often think that we in the Orthodox are so very, 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 very close, and we are very close. But there's some Orthodox who would say, you guys are practically atheists, you know, that mm -hmm. you are, you are, you know, they, and I guess maybe those are some elements in the Orthodox church. We see this in the Catholic church. Some people mm -hmm. who take no salvation outside the church, the Feniites who go mm -hmm. so far to say anybody who is not a baptized Catholic, doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a baptized Orthodox or an atheist, you're, you're damned. Uh, take, you know, I guess maybe that attitude is more prevalent in the Orthodox church from their perspective than we, than we think. You'll find it among, especially the Russians, which of course he is, he's um, a part of. So I'm not surprised, but I do think it's number one inconsistent with Russian uh, Orthodox um, on, on this. Historically, they have not always maintained that. And um, I, again, I, I think it's entirely inconsistent because we're, we're fighting over little words here and there, but then you have a full rebaptism ceremony. I think the elephant in the room needs to be addressed. And in fact, Bishop Callistus Ware, again, well-known Orthodox um, bishop and theologian, himself has decried this practice in Orthodoxy and recognized right. that this is a major problem and we need to fix it. He was hoping the great and holy ecumenical, count, or not ecumenical, but the great and holy council of 2016 would resolve it, but they didn't even discuss it, let alone resolve it. And that, of course, and the the inability to resolve things in pan orthodox councils. That's an entire other thing we could talk about in a show mm. about the the necessity of the magisterium. So, but let's talk. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the sacraments of initiation. Baptism has been changed. Chrismation has been terribly changed, in that though the Latin West had the same form of initiation that we did for centuries, meaning that they received people by baptism, chrismation, and Eucharist. They broke up that sacred trilogy of sacraments, and now they, chris they chrismate or confirm when you're a teenager. So you're baptized without chrism. So you have now baptized, that you have a new invention of type of Christians. The, the Latins have actually created three types of Christians instead of one. We know one, baptized, chrismated, communing Christians. Catholics now have baptized and unconfirmed or unchrismated Christians. They also separate the reception of the Eucharist from childhood till six or seven years old. So now you have baptized, uncommuning Christians. 
you can then have baptized and communing, but unconfirmed Christians. All of this is novelty. All righty. Well, is it novelty, though? Um, the, the problem here is that we have two different sacramental disciplines. And I think what's hard is sometimes when we talk about the West and the Eastern Church, uh, one analogy I've heard is like a mountain. It's like we're going up the same, we are going up the same mountain, we're reaching the same destination. The West, you know, the Northern or Southern, the Western or Eastern face of the mountain might look different. The paths might be a little bit different. Now, this is not religious pluralism because we're all part of the same church, but we have different theological traditions, sacramental disciplines. And uh, for a lot of people who are in the West listening to this, yeah, you were baptized, then you got first communion when you're seven, and then maybe you got confirmed when you were a teenager, or maybe you got confirmed, the age has been going lower and lower. That's because in the early church, uh, in the West, it was seen that it should be the bishop is the one who fully initiates you into the church. Uh, and that's why the West would have the bishop or one of his representatives, his vicars, uh, to administer the sacrament of confirmation. Whereas in the East, it's a different view, but even still you have that because the, the priest, I'm understanding, he has to use a, a very particular kind of chrism oil from the bishop. Um, it's, I gave a talk on this, uh, this, the sacrament of theological differences a while ago, but it, once again, make, making a, a hay out of a particular uh, discipline, which mm -hmm. is changing. And I mean, hey, personally, I would be in favor if the West adopted more of what was happening in the East and mm -hmm. it's something that is changing because the age of confirmation is being lowered. And I think that that's a good thing. So this is an area where we can dialogue. Yeah, I, I like that you put this in the realm of discipline because it is that. And I also agree that I'm, I'm of the Eastern perspective when it comes to discipline, but I don't think that what Latin Catholics are doing is evil or is against God's will. Or that they're or different it, types of, or that they're less of a Christian or that yeah, they're not I, as if yeah. their baptismal graces. Right are somehow just completely yeah. null still without chrismation or the mm -hmm. Eucharist. Um, and mm -hmm. what do you do, especially in more rural and mission areas where the only sacrament you might have for people is baptism until a priest can come in a year or two? They're not less of a Christian than the rest mm -hmm. of us. Yeah, bat baptism is is sufficient. I, I would agree, however, with the Orthodox that there are some added benefits for administering. I totally agree, too. So I agree with that discipline, but I'm not going to say that th this is a major deal breaker between Latins and, and Greeks. And uh, also, you noted a change there that the Orthodox have made when it comes to um, chrismation and discipline. I mean, he's talking about things that Catholics have made. And, of course, he's talking about Latin Catholics, not Eastern Catholics. Mm -hmm. Um well, you mentioned a change that they've actually made, um, and, and that is allowing the presbyter to, of course, administer confirmation. Um, so that, that's an alteration that they have also made. I, I do think it's legitimate. I'm not knocking that discipline. Right. I'm just saying it is an alteration. We've all altered, to some extent or another, some of the sacraments. Um, every, everybody has. I think that's legitimate, and the church has the authority to do that, and it's being done as far as a discipline. It's not an alteration to the substance of the sacraments, which right. is out of bounds. Nobody can change the substance of the sacraments, and Catholics recognize that, but that's not what's being debated here. Right. All right, then so this will come up again, I think, here in the question of the Eucharist. The Eucharist also, for many separate centuries, was served only under one form, not serving the chalice, to believers, but only the body of the Lord. The lift also mentioned that the Latins began to use unleavened bread, which uh, is a very consistent complaint of the East against the West, that they, instead of using a risen loaf, a leavened loaf, which symbolizes the whole body of the church, uh, they used unleavened bread and therefore serve multiple. They, they have nothing from which to fracture. They have one larger um, host that the priest fractures and serves himself. But the people get unfractured, disassociated individual pieces that come, you know, all pressed, the, really nullifying the a very important symbolism of having one loaf and one cup in the chalice. All right. And so once again, this is talking about more um, discipline and also just different ways of celebrating the liturgy. Because what's hard here is, well, 
even in the East, you're going to have different theological schools of thought that have different forms of symbolism and how they express things. So the leaven and unleavened bread, yeah, you can use leavened bread to symbolize the risen Christ. But in the West, you can use unleavened because leaven is also a symbol of sin. Uh, you know, to get rid of the, the old leaven, for example, it's also a, a symbol of that. And so it's something to say that Christ is without that here in the in the bread and wine that we're that we're receiving um well i'm sorry i think um it's getting late as we're recording and my uh my cold has has fogged up my head I, the oh the other thing was um receiving it under the under bread or wine because i well it depends on which eastern church a lot of them i mean the ruthenian they do intinction mm-hmm. dipping the bread uh into the into the into the, the wine the sacred blood mm-hmm. but um i forget which, which council said it but Harkening back to Paul's St. Paul's letters, there was a, a mention of a particular Greek preposition that St. Paul used that it is uh, the, the body or the blood. You know, yeah. either yeah. is the right. full possession of the yeah. body of Christ. You don't have to have both. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was, I believe, the Council of Trent. Um, uh, or it was a Constance, hmm, one of those. Well, yeah. You that, cold, too. It's why you're Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, look, I, I agree with the Eastern discipline here, although there, there isn't really a one uniform discipline. I, I would say that we do need to also consider the Armenian Orthodox, although they're not in communion with the Eastern Orthodox. Um, they are also an apostolic church and they, they use unleavened bread, but um, look, I, I agree with some of his, his disciplinary preferences here, but it's just that it's a disciplinary um, preference. This isn't some kind of uh, deal breaker. Now he, he's saying this was a constant complaint of the East uh, for the West, because yes, the West did change their discipline on uh, they went from unleavened, I'm sorry, from leavened bread to unleavened bread around the 900s, somewhere around there. Um, yeah, that, that was a, a, a disciplinary change that was made, sure. But this complaint that was being made by the Orthodox is in the context of many other complaints that when you start to consider the source of them in the context of them, you realize that they become very petty. So this constant complaint about unleavened versus leavened bread comes from the same people who are complaining uh, that Latin bishops wear rings and miters. Right. Or that their icons look like a Frank. They, or, they, the the people shake, that are... Or beards and clean shaven. Yeah. Or the, the figures of Jesus that they have in there looks like a Frank. I mean, just all kinds of just really odd and petty complaints. Well, th- this was one of them that, yeah. well, these Latins use unleavened bread and that's Judaic. But then they will claim that Latins also don't uh, exercise certain uh, Levitical practices when it comes to clean and unclean food. Right. So it's just kind of an inconsistent argument. There. Yeah. I would just say for our, our Orthodox brethren, you know, golden rule. Uh, yeah. If you would want reunification within the church, and that's the goal we're always seeking. I, I think the ultimate way to accomplish that is going to be through not just, I mean, I have to start with tolerance of uh, diverse practices, liturgically, spiritually, but then eventually moving from tolerance to celebration of differences. And, all, and also, it's interesting to bring up the Armenians, because when we talk about this, you know, what he's saying, oh, the Orthodox, and especially some people who are, you know, the Orthobros type people, mm-hmm. I feel like they could get, they could turn into almost, well, that's what Orthobros are. They're like the mirror mm-hmm. image of uh, fanatical mm-hmm. traditional Latin masters. Nothing wrong with traditional exactly. Latin mass or yeah. devotion to it. That's great. Right. But when you right. say that it's it's this or bust, orthobros, yeah. rad trads, right? What about the rest of the church? What about the Syro Malabar? You know, yeah. what about the Maronites? What about yeah. there? It's not just you, and it's not just you and us either. That I feel yeah. like it gets weird when he gets caught up in these things. I, I agree. I, I think that at this point he's just throwing out everything with the kitchen sink. And yeah, so. basically. <laughs> All right, let's let's see if we can empty the sink out here. We got a few more minutes. Right. Fasting on Saturday. Fasting. Something forbidden go. by Apostolic Canon 66 and the Councils of Trillo of the Sixth Ecumenical Council in Chapter 55. We don't fast on Saturday and Sunday like we fast during the week. And even in a, the most rigorous fasting periods like Lent, 
Monday through Friday are kept one way, but Saturday and Sunday always are is experienced as a lessening in honor of the Sabbath and in honor of the Lord's Day. Not so with the Catholics. Their fasting rules, they change tremendously, including altering the Wednesday-Friday fast, today beyond description, which comes from apostolic times. Uh, today, Catholics, were lucky if the Catholics will not eat meat on Friday. That would be a major step. Um, all right. I didn't get what he was talking about, about Saturday and Sunday. In the Western Church, we don't have fasting on Saturday, Sunday. Some people take up voluntary fasts through all 40 days of Lent, but even they oftentimes, you know, cheat or, you know, celebrate on Sundays. So, and to me, this is, come on, it's, it's discipline. People have, you know, choose different days. Even in the East, the Maronites have, I think, what, like Ash Monday or, mm -hmm. you know, you have, you're going to have variety here. Did, did you notice though that the disciplinary uh, canons that he appealed to were exclusively Eastern canons. Right. Um, he mentioned apostolic canons in the Council of Trullo, which was loosely connected to the Sixth Council, but wasn't, um, not all of it was received by the West. So that that's the thing. These were exclusively Eastern disciplinary canons, and he's expecting Latins to have those imposed on them isn't the very that the very thing that he would complain about you know latinization of eastern christians right why 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 doesn't father josiah follow everything at the council at the baltimore council you know why doesn't, <laughs> right. i don't understand why he would spit in the face of one of these western western councils now look i commend the disciplinary practices that they've maintained in the east I, I at think least it's great at, I, at I, least I, nominal, they know yeah. how to they know how to fast and that's the yeah that's the at least it. on paper i mean now uh, like, whether or not it's actually practice is a little bit different it's not right. seen as a mortal sin if you if you don't keep it as whereas if maybe if you break one of uh the fasts in the catholic church it could be grave matter um but yeah i commend them and look i'm i'm on their side when it comes to preferring that discipline but it's simply that it's a preference and it's a discipline. And this is not something that is dividing Orthodox and Catholics. Right. And this will come up here in our next issue, which is the issue of celibacy and mm -hmm. married priests. One of the more notable differences visible between uh, East and West. <clears throat> the lift also mentioned mandatory clerical celibacy. Uh, this was a big issue. In fact, their relationship to sexuality, especially the sexuality of the priests, is a big separating issue between the East and the West. And I should say something to you about that. As early as the First Ecumenical Council, the delegates of the Roman Pontiff attempted to get the Council to pass a law that all priests, even if they were married when they became priests, must cease from having sexual relations, conjugal union, with their wives if they're going to serve. Uh, the minutes of the council say that one of our great desert fathers, Abba Paphnutius, stood up and said what would become the standard line for the Orthodox to this day. He would say, look, we honor the rigor of the Roman pontiff, um, but to mandate such as a law is to set yourself forward as more holy than the apostles. You're holier than the apostles. <laughs> Who are you to do that? This, is, this was the answer. And Abba Paphnutius won the day. And that would remain a point of contention uh, between the East and the West. So if this was an attempt to take the ruling of the local council of Carthage, which said priests who serve the mass, priests who serve the liturgy, can't sleep with their wives anymore. What the Holy Fathers at the Ecumenical Council did was to take that and say, the effort there was to establish decency and proper preparation for the serving of the sacraments, which does not require perpetual abstinence from conjugal union of married presbyters, but timely, appropriate intercourse, which means that priests do not have relationships with their wives, do not have conjugal union when they're performing the sacraments, when they're preparing to perform a sacrament. A priest would never sleep with his wife the night before he served liturgy. It's just not consonant with the sobriety of fasting and prayer that you're trying to raise yourself to to be able to serve the sacrament. But it doesn't require that at other times you can't sleep with your wife. This is what the, the church is saying. Okay. Uh, and this is, once again, we go back to the historical record because some people will say, oh, you know, Western celibacy was a medieval invention to, you know, keep priests from 
creating an aristocracy with their children and their prop their property goes back to the church, which of course isn't true. Uh, there's several cases. The apostolic origins of priestly celibacy uh, is one. There's two books: a case for clerical celibacy, and another is apostolic origins of of celibacy. The author's name escapes me at the moment, but um, I, th- I think both are from Ignatius Press. Uh, y- yeah, it's to understand. No, there's um, both the tradition of married presbyters, priests, and celibate priests goes all the way back to the New Testament. It goes Mm -hmm. all the way back there, both of them, because Mm -hmm. St. Paul talks about the virtue of celibacy and he lived it out Mm -hmm. in, you know, talking about it in first Corinthians chapter seven. So we see both of this in the early church, uh, but it is celebrated in different ways. And we understand that it just, it shows a different kind of theology in different respects, but the, but the Orthodox agree with us on this point because number one, even if the priests can be married, uh, the bishops can't, and you can't get married after you become a priest if you're unmarried. Um, and two, they understand that he even Father Josiah even mentions it. Well, you know, we don't obviously we're not going to engage in conjugal relations the night before we offer liturgy. Mm-hmm. But what do you do in a sacramental uh, and liturgical tradition that is daily? Mm-hmm. I mean, if the pre like if you want to be a Western priest that lives up to mm-hmm. that Eastern standard, and you offer daily mass, you're de facto celibate mm-hmm. basically. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. If you're going to have that discipline of um, a daily liturgy, that that would then if make sense. So, uh, but did you did you notice he when he was giving this you know rhetorical um, example, <clears throat> he appeals to the minutes of the Council of Nicaea one. Mm-hmm. Did you catch that? There are no minutes of Nicaea one. There's right. no minutes of Nicaea one. There's no minutes of Constantinople one. The first minutes that we have from an uh, ecumenical council is from the Council of Ephesus. We don't know if there were any minutes from Nicaea one or Constantinople one, for that matter. There probably weren't. I mean, if there were, they just are not extant. We don't have any records of them. Right. So I don't know what he's talking about when he speaks of the minutes. And he, he seemed very confident that Abba Paphnutius um said these things at the council i also don't know where he got that from because you had to be i mean it could be hagiography you know it's always like traditions uh, there is a tradition that um you know the same as like saint nicholas punching punching out arius Mm -hmm. at nicaea we're all really confident of that but we don't have great historical evidence Uh, oh now people are gonna throw they're gonna throw tomatoes at me but um i'm actually (laughs) i was thinking about a book uh, because i wrote that book what the saints never said I was thinking to have everyone come out with pitchforks. I was going to write a book called "What the Saints Never Did." Yeah, um, we'll see. But I, I still, I still have a thought on that. But yeah, but once again, this is—they're both valid disciplines. Right. And in the West, even we're tolerant of that. That mm-hmm. Orthodox Anglican, we allow and grant mm-hmm. for uh, married clergy when it is when it's appropriate and when it's mm-hmm. when it serves the good of the church. All right, I think this is the last section that I have um, where Father Josiah talks about how could we come together. And this is the important thing for us to talk about. I mean, of all the Christian denominations in the world, you would think the best hope we have are with those who are closest to us doctrinally and mm-hmm. liturgically and sacramentally and apostolically uh, for, for union. This should be the one we should really aim for with all our, our heart, mind, and soul. Is this something we can? I believe it is something we can do. We'll hear Father Josiah's thoughts, and Michael and I will offer our thoughts. But you see that these lists, they're kind of like, um, you would never find a list like this against the Jews or the Muslims. Oh, by the way, the lists he's talking about are the Byzantine lists, uh, these lists of prohibitions uh, of the, the East had with the West. Michael, I know you actually did a whole show on the Byzantine list, so I commend our listeners, go check that out, that you, you covered them. So go to yeah. Reason and Theology to see more about these, but that's what he's referring to. But this is kind of an inter-family squabble. This is, uh, it, even though the lists are strong and they have very many important things, we're, the very fact that they exist show that we have a lot of history and we're really not happy about walking away from each other. We're really not happy about that. And we're going to have a little fight about it and we're going to fuss. I've often thought, what if something did happen? What if? You know, Pope John Paul II many times read the Nicene Creed in public without the filioque. He did it, and he liked doing that. What if something happened where the popes would give up? Uh, the Catholic Archbishop of San Francisco is a friend of mine. His name is uh, Salvatore Cordiglione, great man. 
He was he's from San Diego, was assistant bishop, bishop down there. He's a canonist from Rome, he studied in Rome, and a great lover of orthodoxy. He is a great lover of orthodoxy. And I have heard him in public say many times that he believes the Catholic Church should cease saying any council that they've held after the Great Schism is ecumenical. Because, you know, the Catholics kept on suggesting that their councils were the councils of the whole church, even though we weren't there. He says, we should stop that. We should say they're all local councils and up for discussion. If we could get, if bishops like that were talking, and they said, you know what, that became the position of the Catholic Church. They're going to relegate all post schism dogmatic decrees to the trash bin and come back based upon the faith of the first millennium and deal with us. That would be a mighty miracle. That would be an incredible miracle. Please, God, may that happen. That would be fantastic. But still, practically speaking, what do you do the next day? This is what I thought. Let's say it happened, and we could all announce in our churches that the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church have been reunited after a thousand years of separation. Could any of us actually go to church? Technically, we could. But could any of us actually go to church in a Catholic parish? I think in where I live, our people just couldn't stomach it. They just couldn't stomach it. They would go there, and they wouldn't recognize where they were. They would simply not feel that, that they could do it. It would just be torture for them. It would have to be not just a decree from the top, but a renovation, a reincorporation of traditional Orthodox Catholic life with regards to worship and prayer and all the things that we know of reverence in the church. May God bless uh, our interactions with the Catholics and make something, surprise us with something great. A major point and then a minor point, and then eager for your thoughts. The major point being, if we ask the, uh, the Orthodox to become Catholic, we're not asking them to become Roman Catholic. We're not asking them to become Latin right Catholics. We're just asking, look, just <laughs> look, just uh, all we'd be saying is just affirm, do what the Ruthenian Catholic Church did at the Treaty of Brest in the 16th century to come into communion, but you would retain. Your, you would retain the liturgy. You would, you would essentially be a separate rite within the church. We're not, we're, we're not at, I'm not asking you to suddenly go to a church where they're playing guitars and wearing flip-flops or what have you. Um, so I guess that was the major reaction that I, that I had from that. Um, the minor point, I don't know what he was referring to with, with Archbishop Cordelione. Uh, we, it's, we can't throw out the post-schism mm -hmm. councils and all of their infallible <laughs> definitions, such as <laughs> right. the Council of Trent, Lateran. Uh, maybe what he meant, I don't know, maybe he, maybe just what he meant was we just don't give them that term. Right. Like we, we have a particular term for the first seven and we recognize they're special because mm -hmm. it was before the schism. Uh, but we can't throw out their authority. But mm. we can recognize you know the this the, the specialness of the first of the first seven uh so that would be the minor point but the major point is and i think that's a hindrance to to union is we're not ask, asking you to 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 be to become latin right yeah i i agree I, I don't know what the archbishop said so i can't comment on what he, he said specifically but what father josiah said about the archbishop i can comment on that it is absolutely impossible for the catholic church to throw out any of the post-schism ecumenical councils teachings that are definitive teachings on matters of doctrine absolutely impossible yeah. for us to throw away these definitive teachings is for us to say that either we lost a universal teaching authority which we believe is part of the constitution of the church so it can't right. be lost either we lost it or there is no teaching authority that is universal which is also not compatible because we believe it came from christ and is part of the constitution of the church that's um, a position that's unacceptable to catholics there's absolutely no way that we could ever say that some catholics can believe this def is definitive and others don't have to believe it or that what we once thought was definitive is now no longer definitive that if that's up for grabs nicaea is up for grabs everything's up for grabs because there is no universal teaching yeah. authority but what i think is going on is yes the disciplinary canons would not apply to the east and the way in which we formulate our right. doctrinal teachings would not apply so we use the term transubstantiation 
to speak about the mystery of the Eucharist. Well, they would need to affirm the proposition, right? what we're actually teaching in substance, but they wouldn't have to use the term in the way in which we express right. it. They don't have to use terms, substance, and accidents yeah. so as long as the, the meaning is the yeah, same. Yeah, some of the Eastern fathers used a term, uh, metastoichiosis, which mm -hmm. in uh, Greek, which roughly translated would be the English trans-elementation. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, or you could use a different word than purgatory. I mean, you guys, yeah. I mean, the East has different words for, uh, you know, all kinds of things. You know, we have the sacrament of matrimony. They have the mystery of crowning. You know, you have uh, all of the, you know, confirmation versus chrismation. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. you're right. So we could, what we could do is in having union is say that, you know, these are the essential truths of our faith, mm -hmm. but we can dialogue about how you articulate them. Yes. Here are the, here are the questions that are closed, defined, de, define, defide, they're done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how we articulate them, uh, different uh, secondary aspects of them, that's something that we can, that we can talk about. But I think that it's just, look, for if you're Eastern Orthodox, to bring the Orthodox into communion with Rome, we're not asking for the destruction of the beautiful treasures in the east i think both you and i michael agree mm -hmm. it, i really like it a lot uh yeah. I, I i attend when i can uh, a byzantine catholic church here though it's a bit of a drive from where we are um, i think you guys have something similar mm -hmm. um where you live um it's a beautiful treasure we would just like it to be in closer communion with the church christ established and there's ways we can do that yeah, I mean, personally, I, I've started a, um, I have a little private chapel um, where a priest from Texas is going to be coming out once a month. So I've started a, um, with with his blessing and the blessing of the archdiocese, a um, a chapel so that liturgies, Byzantine divine liturgies in communion with Rome can be served. So I'm, I'm right on board with some of these disciplinary and liturgical preferences. Right. I'm right there with him. Um, at the same time, I'm not going to condemn Latin brethren and say that they are somehow in sin or this is a major barrier between East and West. Right. We would never, I would never ask the East to give up the, you know, the divine liturgy. And no, I wouldn't ask no. everyone in the West to give up the mass of, uh, Paul the six or the Trinitine right. mass to say, right. you know, uh, there's beauty in the diversity. Well, yeah. we had a we had a good time reviewing this. Uh, Michael, where can people go to learn more about you and to see uh, all the good work that you're doing? Uh, ReasonInTheology.com. And of course, also just go to YouTube, type in Reason and Theology, and you'll see the YouTube channel. All righty, sir. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Michael. And I hope you all have a very thanks. blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.